Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Well, good morning, church family. I'm Barrett Bowden, lead pastor here, and welcome to those who are online. Welcome to those who are in the room. Uh, I'm going to pray for us as we continue our time of worship today in God's Word. Father, thank you uh, so much for being our God. And we thank you today for being our God of restoration. Lord, I pray today for your grace upon us, your people. Lord, we thank you for your mercy toward us, your love grace given so freely, what you have done for us from start to finish in your son, Jesus. We thank you for the sufficiency of his life, death, and resurrection for us. And Lord, we know that all of our hope is in you, who you are, what you've done, what you promised, what you will do. And we come today to bring our hearts and lives again to you. God, we just pray for your ministry in our midst. Um, as we open your word, we ask God that you would speak. Lord, I confess my total dependence upon you. Lord, I just want to make much of you as I teach today. I want earnestly your spirit to move in our hearts. So God, we yield ourselves to you and we just ask for your grace. Remind us of who you are, your heart toward us your promises to us, your power available for us, that we might grow closer to you today. We pray this for your glory and in the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning to those who are home. Hopefully you said good morning too. Um, I'm Barrett Bowden, lead pastor here at ICC and um, we are going to be kicking off a little interlude series, I'd like to call it, over the next few weeks, looking in the book of Nehemiah. So if you've got your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, I would encourage you to get them open to the book of Nehemiah, which is in the Old Testament. And we're going to be in this book uh, for uh, just a few Sundays here. Um, and so as you're turning, I'll kind of explain a little bit of, of what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks together. Um, as you might can tell from the video that just played before the message and even from the, the slide that's here, over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about a longing for restoration. A longing for restoration. Do you guys know, you probably do, but I don't know if you've thought about it lately, that it has been literally almost a year since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Isn't that unbelievable? Almost a full year now, some of us feel like it's been five years, um, and we feel the immense burden that this past season has been, and we go, for crying out loud, you ain't got to tell me, uh, definitely understand that it has been a year. Others of us are kind of in this place where it's like, seriously, it's been a year already? Um, can I get a mulligan? Because it literally just feels like it's only been a few weeks since this thing started. I mean, how is it possible that a full year, we've gone around the sun a full time almost, 
since this thing started. How is that even possible, right? So if you're in the first category and you're like, if it was five years, let me see your hands. Anybody else feel like it's been like five weeks or shorter? Okay, somewhere in between. Reality is, though, it's been, it's been a year. Um, not just time-wise, but in the, in the use of the phrase, it's been a year. Can I get a witness? And, um, you know, some of us even have, I really believe, begun to forget in some ways what it was even like before all of this. There's kind of this settling down into the new normalcy of what is. And something that is very much on my heart for this current season, over the next few weeks, we're going to be beginning a a new book of the Bible study in just a few weeks. But something that is really on my heart before we jump back into another long series is to take a few weeks here around the one-year anniversary of the start of COVID-19 And honestly, to take a few weeks here around the start of what is our Lenten season. Some of you guys are freaking out that I'm even mentioning this, um, but I've got to tell you, we are only 56 days away from Easter. Now, Easter is probably the last thing that's on your minds right now, but the reality is our rhythms have been so disrupted that we do feel a bit off of the traditional rhythms of our lives personally and the rhythms of our life as a church. But if you know anything about the Easter season, the Lenten season, which traditionally starts around 40 days before Easter, so it kicks off in about a week and a half, all right? It is a season really that brings opportunity for two main things. One is this. It's a season for anticipation and also for hope. For anticipation and also for hope. As we think about the opportunity we have to approach intentionally toward Easter Sunday and toward the significance of, of our Savior, the whole focus of the, of, of the Lenten season is our Savior Jesus, who he is and what he has done for us in his life and in his, his death for the forgiveness of our sins and in his burial in the grave on our behalf and in his resurrection from the dead to ensure new life forever with God for all who believe. Truly, as we focus upon Jesus, it is an opportunity for us to live not in the... Uh, uh, One more month, you know, the the monotony and the drudgery and just the frustration of what seems to continue to be. it's It's an opportunity for us to look toward Jesus and to look toward his work and his sufficient grace and toward his promise and toward the things that are to come. And to really, once again, sense deeply in our relationship with the Lord and as a church family, anticipation of the greater things that are to come and a, and a real infusal of hope. First Peter says we've been born again to a living hope who is Jesus Christ. Hope is not defined for us by circumstance. Hope is defined for us by the character of our God and the sufficient work that he has done in his cross and his resurrection. So it's an opportunity for anticipation and hope, but it's also an opportunity for preparation and renewal. Some of us know Lent. Uh, Those who come from more religious traditions might be familiar with a season of like fasting, right? And you know, basically, there's like all these things we're supposed to give up around Lent in order to get ready for for Easter. But you've got to be careful not for the Lenten season just to become a religious routine. Because the deeper um, desire for those who really have relationship with Jesus is to, to really evaluate, God, what in my heart and life needs renewal? What in this season might you be desiring to restore in me? And how can I posture myself? How can I posture myself to experience more of you? How can I posture myself to to really allow for the goodness of your grace to just be flooded into my heart and life in this season, a season of renewal. And so as we think about the launch of this season toward Easter, over the next few weeks, right, as we personally and as a church kind of get ready to think about the journey toward the cross, 
what I want to do is to focus on this aspect of renewal. And in fact, um, what I want to be talking about really is that really, as we think about renewal, God begins his work within us. And the prayer that I want to lead us to pray is, God, would you prepare my heart for renewal? Would you restore me? There's a lot of things, I believe, that have been lost this past year. I don't know what it looks like in your life. I know what it looks like in mine. Some of it has happened to us. Some of it, though, some of it, though, has happened within us. And what I'm wondering is, are we in a place that we genuinely, from the bottom of our hearts, can cry out, God, would you do a work of renewal in me? Yeah, there's a lot of things we cannot change. But there are some things deep within that I really believe we can bring to the Lord and say, God, I desire restoration. And in this season, my heart for our church is that we together would be able to anticipate with great hope the significance of celebrating what Christ has done for us. But we'd also be able to come with earnest hearts and say, God, would you, would you do this restoring work in me? So Nehemiah chapter 1 this morning. Everybody there in your Bible? If not, it's on the screen. And what we're going to be doing today is reading chapter 1 together and then kind of talking back through it as we journey together in God's word. Starting in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As I heard these words, I, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned, and we've acted very corruptly against you, and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, and keep my commandments and do them. Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them, and I will bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So this is Nehemiah 
chapter 1, all right? I don't know if you're familiar with the story of Nehemiah. I'm not going to be doing an entire book study on the book, but it is always important that you're able to piece together, like, where is this passage in the scripture in relation to the big story of God, right? So Nehemiah takes place about 445 years before Jesus was born, okay? About 141 years or so before Nehemiah opens, what had happened was the Babylonians had come in, all right, this is in history and in Old Testament history as well, but they had come in and they had actually destroyed the city of Jerusalem and taken a huge majority of the Israelites, the people of God, away from Jerusalem and they're holding them in captivity in their empire. Nehemiah was actually in Susa, which is like modern day Iran. He's far from Israel and he happens to be the cupbearer to the king, the guy who stands in the king's court, usually is a guy that is absolutely trusted. He's standing there to taste and to eat and to drink things before the king does um, in order to make sure the king is gonna stay healthy. But obviously, it is also a position of great influence in many ways. And so what happened was, this is a huge deal, right? Um, the destruction of Jerusalem. Because the, the, if you remember God's promise to Abraham early in the Bible, Abraham was a man by faith. He told him he was going to form of them a nation, and he was going to make of them a people, and he was going to lead them to a promised land. And in fact, he had done that. He had led them to Israel. And he had allowed Jerusalem to be set up as the capital. And you remember, as we've been talking about in the Go Mission series recently, that it was a come and see mentality in the Old Testament. God would bless his people and the nations would come and see the blessing that God had brought to them and they would recognize that he is God, right? So Jerusalem was this, this place where... Where the, the people of God, yes, lived, but the presence of God was known to dwell, and the blessings of God were meant to be made manifest, and the name of God was meant to be made great. And so you can imagine the incredible, incredible horror to the people of God when God actually fulfilled part of his warning against them because he had told them, if you stay close to me, I'll continue to bless you, but if you go far from me, you will reap consequence. I will allow even your enemies to overtake you. And in fact, what had happened before the Babylonian invasion and the destruction of Jerusalem and captivity is just that. And 141 years or so before Nehemiah writes the book, the enemies of God came in and the walls that had surrounded Jerusalem were destroyed. That place that was to be known as the place where the people of God dwelt, the presence of God dwelt, and the name of God was made great had become a laughing stock, so to speak. And God's people were drug away against their will and were being held captive all across the region by people who were enemies of God. Well, it's interesting. This is kind of how um, the book opens, right? Right? But what I find interesting about the book and why I believe it has so much relevance for us today is that Nehemiah, as the book opens, gets word of what has happened in Jerusalem 141 years earlier and what is presently happening in Jerusalem. And instead of just being like, eh, yeah, doesn't it suck? Or, yeah, it's just the way it's been for 141 years or yeah, whatever. Something happens within him that really is the beginning of his experience of the restoration of God. And it can be the beginning of our experience of the restoration of God too. And what happens in him is this, brokenness. Brokenness. God broke his heart. It's interesting, sometimes the familiar, I think everybody can probably understand this, sometimes the familiar in our lives can become normative. Isn't that true? Sometimes the familiar in your life can become normative, such that the way 
you begin to believe about the things you're presently experiencing is just, well, that's just the way it's always been, and that's just the way it'll always be. And the struggle with this is when this begins to happen in our lives, we begin to become numb and closed off to the opportunity to see the restoration of God and the things that God wants to do. When we begin to normalize things that are just presently familiar to us, we begin to shut off opportunity for God to really bring his perspective to things and ultimately through that to bring his restoration to things. One of the things that's remarkable to me about what happened in Nehemiah chapter 1, if you go back to the text, is when the, when the book opens, the words come to Nehemiah about what happens there in Jerusalem, about the Jews who had escaped and survived, and he hears, he gets perspective. He hears the story once more. The remnant there, they're in trouble and they're in shame and the wall is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. But what happens next in verse four is as soon as he hears these words, again, he doesn't just go, yeah, it's just the way it is. Isn't that sad? Isn't that too bad? But he sees it the way God sees it and he sits down and he weeps and he mourns. And he does as it says, for days. And he continues fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And we know that this goes on for about four months. He gets a fresh perspective. I really believe this book is so relevant in our lives because this, this story you, we might go, oh, this is history. I don't really understand like, what the, what's going on uh, with this for me. But I do believe that God gives us this story um, because it is not uncommon in our lives to have things that are broken, things that are devastated. In our lives, personally, in our hearts, in our minds, in our habits, in our families, in our church, in our community, our city, our world. Isn't it often? I mean, who could give a witness, right? That you have things in your life that just feel broken, that just feel overwhelmingly difficult, that just, that just reek of a feeling of loss, things that are just not right, things that can be in disarray. It could be in discord but in it with, with God. It could be discord within ourselves. It could be discord in our relationships. Certainly it could be discord in our world. And, and I just wonder, like how many of us have the temptation to have this brokenness, to experience this devastation, to have the sense of loss, to have these, this discord, and yet we just go, well, it's just the way it is. Even in the midst of this pandemic, I mean, one of the, the burdens on my heart pastorally right now is that it hasn't been 141 years, but it has been a year. And I really believe that there are things in my life that I have gotten just settled down into that ought not be this way. Simply because we've been forced into a year of just like, all of us are going like, well, what? But now, when at one time, my home and life was a beacon of ministry and activity, now it's like, feels like the doors are shuttered. Now, at one time where my life was lived in absolute community with others, how many of us are going, now a year later, I'm like, I'm still struggling to figure out like, how to even have a relationship outside my small bubble? How many of us at one time, we woke up early in the morning to seek the Lord in worship, to spend time with him and his word, 
before heading out on a day of purpose, and now we're literally, some of us, still stuck at home working all the time, and we've just become apathetic. We've become numb. And the last time we've sincerely, passionately sought the Lord, enjoyed personal worship, spent time in his word, we, we don't even remember when it was. I could go on and on and on. The statistics right now about things that we, together as a people, are all across the world, but especially here in America, are experiencing new things, new habits that have formed or things that used to be that are no longer. I, I just wonder how many of us, even just a year into it, are suddenly like, well, this is just the way that it is. And we've lost, we've lost perspective on not just, okay, it's not just about the way that it is. The big question is, what does God desire it to be? What does God desire it to be? And in a work, in a moment of God's grace, here in Nehemiah's life, he had opportunity to actually see it for what it is and to be broken. I'm wondering if you would like Nehemiah, be willing to ask for a fresh perspective of what's going on. What, what am I talking about? What is the contrast between what God has promised, or you could use here desired, what God desires, and what presently is? I'm just asking this week, I really am truly asking you, some of you are sitting here listening to me, but I'm going to turn it back on you for a second. I'm really asking for you to do some work this week and in the season ahead to really evaluate the contrast between what God desires, what God promises, and, and, and what actually is right now in your heart, in your family, in our church, community, world. And that you really be open to like hearing it for the first time, like, like Nehemiah, that you would be open to saying, God, would you give me grace such that, that I wouldn't just be, be so familiar with this, that I would just become, that this would just become normal. Would you give me grace, God, to, to, to break me over what is not what you desire, where there's a gap? Oh, God, would you help me to see it? And would you help me Help me to desire change. In your life, um, I just wonder, you know, what has been lost? What has been lost this year? I, I really am asking you to evaluate. This is not work that I can do for you preaching. This is work that, you know, all change begins with your personal desire. You, you got to want this. You gotta want restoration. I'm, tell, I'm, I'm gonna proclaim to you today, we have a God of restoration. We see that from the book of Nehemiah. We'll look more at that in a second. But do you know where it starts? Is do, you, do you even desire it? Do you see your need for it? E even just this past year, I would just ask, you know, what has been lost? Are there areas of your mind, of your heart, of your relationship with God, relationship with others, your sense of purpose and passion in life and ministry in your habits and your spiritual disciplines. Listen, what in your life has been lost and what is it that needs to be restored? If someone were to come and to make an objective report about you um, to yourself and they were to show up this week at your door and they say, hey, I just want to talk to you about kind of like where, where things were a year ago and then like where you are today. Or even just... Taking God's word, I just want to kind of talk to you about what God desires and where you are today. Like, do you have a yearning to even listen? And then do you have a willingness to even be broken? So the question here, as we think about God's work of restoration, we have to recognize his work begins in me, and it starts with, uh, with brokenness. And the prayer is, God, would you break my heart? But it doesn't end there, because the next thing that happens is once you're at a place and you've got to start here, everybody's got to do this work personally where you really evaluate and you're really willing to go to God and say, God, would you break me? 
But it moves from there to, God, would you grow my dependence? All right? So God's work in me. We talked about brokenness. But it moves quickly to dependence. And the prayer here is, God, would you grow my faith? Would you grow my faith? Um, Where you run in crisis shows where your hope and trust really is. This week in my own life, um, we've had some personal family things that have been going on that have been really hard. My dad actually right now, as I'm teaching, is in surgery in a hospital in Atlanta. We found out about some things that are going on in his body, and y'all can join me in prayer for him. My preaching here this morning, though, I want to tell you, is an act of trust in God. I had to evaluate yesterday, and all of us face crisis moments in life, but where you run in crisis shows what's really going deep, deep down in terms of where your hope is and where your trust is. And yesterday, I had to choose, God, I'm coming to you. And I want to spend my time in prayer. And this morning, I'm choosing, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'm not going to sit somewhere anxious about what I cannot control, but I'm going to trust your sovereign hand to the point that, God, I want to be free to continue to do what you've called me to do. And I believe God is faithful. He hears those who really run to him for hope and trust. You know, one of the things that I love about the story of Nehemiah is Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He was a cool dude. He had the, the ear of the king. We know later he actually will begin to get involved in conversation with him. But what I love about this story is the first place that Nehemiah goes is where? He goes to God. He didn't go to his buddies to talk about it. He doesn't go to the news to try to figure it out. He doesn't go to, you know, a self-help program or try to get it together himself or try to just take action initially. He goes to God. And what he shows us is that the people of God go to God. When we have things that are going on in our minds and in our hearts and in our circumstances that are just not right, when we recognize there's brokenness, when we see that there's disarray, when we, when we, when we come to our senses and get a perspective, oh my gosh, I'm sitting on my couch watching Netflix four freaking hours every night. Sorry for using the word freaking, Mom. I, I, I've been working on that. When we get perspective and we go, oh my gosh, like I don't even know when the last time I've spent time in the Bible is. Oh my goodness, like I am literally learned to like live my life alone. I don't even have community anymore. When, when you begin to realize like my whole life revolves around me, I'm not serving. I'm not actively like making the gospel known through my life. This year has just literally been, I've just become a self-absorbed person or we've become a self-absorbed family. Whatever those things are, when you begin to recognize those things, the first place that we go, our instinct, the instinct, the impulse of the people of God is to go to God. We go to God. And what we do is we turn our need into prayer. And we do it urgently. What I want to show you this morning is the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. And I really believe that it's a prayer that we can learn to pray. Um, The reason I believe this prayer is so, so good and important for us is because it's a prayer that is directed toward God. And it's a prayer that obviously honored God and that he blessed because we know if you read the whole book of the Nehemiah, this prayer was answered. So it's not just this one dude's prayer in this one time. It's actually a prayer that God gives us in his word as a model for what it looks like when you realize chaos, when you realize disarray in your own life, in your circumstances, and you want to know what to do. You start by being broken, and then you move to being dependent. And here's what God shows us is what it looks like to be a person of God who's truly desirous for the restoration of God and is truly dependent upon him. All right? 
There's four parts to the prayer. We're going to go through them briefly. The first thing, and I hope you have notes this morning, you have opportunity to write some of this down, because again, the goodness of this message is not hearing it preached, but actually putting it into practice. And I pray that God will give grace to you such that you might live in prayer like Nehemiah over the coming weeks um, in the way that he did. The first part of the prayer that we see Nehemiah pray, again, our hope for renewal, all right, in these four things, is he, he prays according to God's character. He prays according to God's character. If you go back to the text and you look there at verse 5, As he prays out, he says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. O God, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel. What I love about this prayer is it is completely earnest. You know, God doesn't hear all kinds of prayers. I mean, he hears them, but he doesn't respond to all kinds of prayers. The prayer of the righteous are powerful and effective. It's the prayers of those who have a, not a ritualistic view of prayer. Do you remember Jesus when he talked about this and they asked, you know, how to pray? And he says, be careful. Don't be like those Pharisees that go out and just use tons of words and they think they're heard by the amount of their words and how big and how pretty their words are and how many people are listening. He says, don't be like that. You go in your closet. The Father who sees you in secret, he will reward you. In other words, the heart of the people of God, true people of God, when we pray, is not to just go through religious routine, but just to go in the simplicity and the earnestness of our own heart knowing that we're praying to a great God and an awesome God and a living God, knowing that right now at this moment as we cry out, our God hears us and he responds to us. But what I love here is that he focuses his attention on the character of God. Sometimes in our prayers, I think sometimes we go to God and we think about our own worthiness to be praying and we get consumed a lot with ourselves and Let that be the basis of whether or not God will hear us. But God says, before you do that, I want you to get consumed with me. As you go to come to me in prayer, I want you to be consumed with me. Do you really believe that I am here? Do you really trust me? Do you really know that I can move? Do you really believe that I can change things? Nehemiah cries out to the God of heaven. He uses the word Yahweh, the great and the awesome God, God who is strong, God who is able, God who I fear and revere, and God who is a God who is a promise maker and also a promise keeper. He says, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant. In other words, God, I know that you are faithful to your words. And not only that, but God, I know that you love. He says there in verse 5, the word in Hebrew, hesed, is the word of steadfast love. He's a covenant-keeping, faithful, always loving God. He has a relationship with his people, and the relationship is based on his grace toward them, and that will never change. He is a God of love toward those who love him and, and keep his commandments. As we pray, guys, we, we pray with our heart directed toward the character of God. We praise. We start our prayers in praise, directing our attention toward who he is, what he has done, and our confidence in prayers as we pray for restoration in this season. You know, if I'm just trying to think very personally and practically, If you're struggling, for instance, if you have gotten caught in some new habit of life and you are genuinely desirous to see God restore in this season, when you go to God, I would just encourage you to remember who he is. Remember who he is. Remember that this God is the God who dwelt among us, who people came to him and he reached out and just by touching the hem of his garment, they were healed. Remember his heart. Remember his power. Remember his ways. 
Our hope is not built on present circumstance. Our hope is built upon the character of God. Remember him. He goes on and he continues to pray and he says, not only, God, am I praying with my attention directed toward your character, but he also says this. He's praying with his attention directed, if you can go and put up the next slide, toward his forgiveness. Toward his forgiveness. If you look at the prayer in verses 6 and 7, what you realize there in verse 6, as he continues to pray, he says, I'm praying before you, praying for the people of Israel, your servants. But then he says this, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. And then he says in verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you. And we've not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. What, what Nehemiah is doing here is he's seeking God with his whole heart. But as he's seeking God, he's saying, God, I, I just got to admit, I, I know what you see. Like, I know that like part of, part of why we are where we are is because in our hearts, like we've, we've grown cold towards you. We, we've grown far from you. We've sinned against you. The, the things that you've desired, we've been like, no, um, I don't think that I want that. The things you've not desired, I, I've actually in my heart said, I, I kind of want that. Nehemiah here is going to the Lord and he's saying very, very honestly, I, I think you've heard me say before, confession the best understanding of it that I have taught before and I'll continue to teach is its agreeance with God. Sometimes in confession we think we're telling God something new, but we're really not telling him a whole lot new, are we? He already knows. The struggle I believe that we often have with confession is that sometimes I think it's hard for us to come to a point that we are genuinely willing to agree with God. Do you really agree with him? Do you agree about what he sees, about what he knows, about what grieves his heart? Again, it's not bringing new information to God when you confess. It's actually bringing your heart to God and saying, God, I know, and I agree with you. And what Nehemiah is doing is he's moving not just from the general. Yes, he starts in the general, confessing the general sins of the people, but he also is confessing the personal and the specific. We've acted very corruptly against you and we've not kept, we've not kept your commandments. I'm wondering in this season, um, as we move toward hope and renewal and we think deeply in our own hearts and lives, I, I wonder what is there from this past year, from this past season that just needs to be confessed. It needs to be brought to God just to agree with him. I, I wonder for you, like, what it would look like to really experience restoration is beginning to, to just come and align your heart with God's heart and to just be willing in general ways, but also in specific ways. Um, for instance, there are things in my life this year that I just don't think I've done a great job leading my, my family. I mean, I'm talking about Barrett here. There, I mean, I don't want y'all to think that I'm a, like rebelled and been a terrible leader, but some of the things that I was really intentional to do about the use of our time and about the regularity of, of family worship and prayer together, th there are some things that just in my life, I just think, God, like I've become apathetic in some ways. And there's some things that I'm presently experiencing, some restoration that I think is needed that really, it starts with me owning up and saying, God, this was not because of the pandemic. The pandemic didn't cause this. My heart caused this. My waywardness, my stubbornness, my apathy. And, and I just need to start, before I start getting busy doing something else, just actually coming to God and saying, God, would you forgive me this year? for not acting in some of the ways that you've desired for me to act, for walking in ways that you have not desired for me to walk. And I'm wondering for you, 
what that would look like if you took that journey seriously in this season. But Nehemiah doesn't stop there. He, he does. He calls out upon the character of God. He does spend time agreeing with God in confession and, and asking for God's forgiveness, but he moves to actually claiming God's promises. Claiming God's promises. And if you want to know what restoration can look like in your life, one of the things that we can learn from Nehemiah here is what it looks like to really claim the promises of God. Look at verse 8 and 9 in your Bible. Nehemiah says, Remember the word you've commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and I will bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. What I love here is Nehemiah is entreating with God, similar to what we see again and again with the people of God. And he's actually going back to a promise that God made in Deuteronomy chapter 30 which he knows. And he's saying, God, I, 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 remember, I know you gave this word to Moses. And I know that you are not just a promise maker, you're a promise keeper. And God, right now, I want to put all of my hope in your promise. And I'm bringing to your attention, God, what you have said to me. I'm bringing to your attention what you've said to your people. And that is, yes, if we were stubborn and hard-hearted, that yes, we would be dispersed. And that has presently been experienced. But I don't want the 141 years of familiarity with our present situation to keep us from experiencing a restoration that you could bring to bring us back, God. Yes, I've been here for a long time, but I don't have to stay here because, God, what your promise has said is that if we come back to you with our whole hearts, that you will bring us back. And so, God, I'm not banking my hope for restoration on our ability to get ourselves together and do this thing, but I am banking on your promise. And your word, God, says that this is who you are and this is how you will act. And so I'm coming to you, God, saying, here we are, God. Our hearts are coming back to you. And I'm banking my hope for restoration on your character, your forgiveness, but also, God, your promise. Amen? Amen. This is the heart of those who really seek God, who really seek God in prayer. And my goodness, do we not have tons of promises of God to bank our hope on for restoration? Does not God say that he, if, if peace has been lost in this season, that God will give perfect peace if your mind is fixed on him? Does not God promise over and over and over and over and over and over and over in the Bible so many things for those who believe? Grace, hope, justification, forgiveness, Holy Spirit, empowerment, all things working together good, nothing separating us from the love of Christ, our labor not being in vain, his work transforming us into our likeness with a power that doesn't come from us, but a power that comes from him, his comfort, his peace, his provision of all of our needs, the fact that he will never leave us or forsake us, the fact that he will bring us near by the blood of Jesus, that he will use our trials for our maturity, that he will be faithful to all that he has promised until the end. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on, but the reality is God has made promises and the question is not whether the promises are true, but whether or not we'll bank our hope on them. Will we be people who go to God believing him for what he has promised and responding to him in faith? The last thing that I see God doing here in Nehemiah's heart is leading Nehemiah to pray according to God's purposes. He prays according to God's character. He prays according to God's forgiveness. He prays according to God's promise, but he also prays according to God's purpose. And he says there in verses 10 and 11, they are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. 
One of the things that made Nehemiah successful, I heard Sandy Wilson train on this one time. Sandy Wilson used to be the pastor of Second Presbyterian here in Memphis, and he was a pastor to pastors when I first started pastoring about 10 years ago. And he says, you know, one of the things that we get wrong all the time is we in our prayer life will go to demand that God get into our story rather than go to God to say, oh God, would you help me to see yours? Nehemiah's prayer here is not that God would enter into his story, but he's asking God, would you help us enter into yours? He's, after 140 years, he's not asking, what is going on here? But rather, he's asking God, could you help me see what you're doing? He's yearning that, that God would once again allow his people to be a part of the eternal purposes of God. He's yearning to, 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 to just be a part of the things that God is doing. And he's saying, God, would you let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant. We are your people. You have redeemed us by your great power and by your strong hand. And he's crying out for God's faithfulness to his people and for God to work with power to use his people to fulfill his purposes. And the same is true for us today. I think in so many ways, many of us have been frustrated and stuck in the season that we're in because we've been praying the wrong prayer. We've been asking God to get into our story rather than surrendering, saying, God, would you help me to see your story? And I believe that if we're really going to see restoration, one of the things that we've got to do is surrender and remember the commitment of God to his people for good and be willing to surrender.